Everybody, thank you so much for coming to the program, Ohio Native Grasses and Sedges for Your Landscape. With us today is Gail Martin, the owner of Natives in Harmony Nursery. So thank you very much, Gail, for coming today and for giving us all this information right before you know the growing season hits. At the end of the program, we will uh, go through and basically answer the questions one by one. So absolutely put them in there. All right, Gail, thank you. All right, well, if everybody's ready, I guess I'm ready too. You know, when I was asked about doing this for grasses and sedges, and thank you, Marty Frito, for that, <laughs> I, I wasn't quite sure because I've done a lot of planting grasses and sedges, but not really landscaping with them. I had to really think about this and, and try and figure my way through it. So I'm just going to use that as my disclaimer to start out with. One of the reasons you're doing uh, uh, native grasses and sedges and thinking about putting them in your landscape is because they should be a natural component any design native landscape. They're the perfect complement for wildflowers, whether you're doing a naturalized garden or something more formal. And those grasses and sedges have deep roots. It helps them survive even when the weather gets maybe a little tough on things that aren't native. So they're a good choice either way. Now, one of the things you have to understand about sasses is they might be annual. Although most of our native sedges are perennials, there are some of the grasses that are annual. So you wanna make sure that when you do pick up a grass to put in your landscape, you know exactly what it is. Many of the sedges are much smaller than grasses. So, you know, you think about a native grass, maybe big blue stem gets pretty tall. You're not gonna have a native sedge that gets that tall. And, but they, the sedges are important because they support a variety of animals and all the sedges are gonna be found in the genus Carrots and that's about 2000 species. It's one of the largest plant genera in, on the earth. So warm season, cool season, a lot of people don't understand what that means. And so I thought maybe we ought to talk about that for just a couple of seconds. Grasses that mature early in the growing season and start growing while the soil is cool are referred to as cool season grasses. Those would be things like Virginia wild rye, Canada wild rye, and June grass. And then sedges are also gonna be cool season growers. What's nice about being a cool season grower is if you've got a a plant that you put in the landscape, you want it to jump to growing usually pretty quickly. If you put something like Indian grass, little blue stem, big blue stem, purple love grass, or prairie drop seed in, they're going to take their time getting started growing in the spring because they want warmer soil to grow. So they're not gonna jump to it as fast as those cool season grasses and cool season sedges. I wanted to point out there is a there's a little saying that lots of you may have heard. Sedges have edges, roses are round, grasses have nodes from the top to the ground. And if you look at the upper left, that is a rush. It's a cross section of a rush. So you can see definitely round. And then that really nice triangular shaped stem, that is your sedge. So it's one of the easy ways to tell if you see a grass or what you think might be a grass that's out in the landscape and you think, I kind of like how that looks, feel the stem because if it's triangular, it's going to be a sedge. And then of course, grasses are usually hollow and they're round, although they might appear flattened on the outside and this cross section kind of shows you that. So there, it's kind of fun. I love taking kids out and letting them feel grassy looking things to see if they can tell whether it's a rush, a sedge, or a grass. Now, grasses and sedges can be used for a lot of different things. There's a lot of ornamental and structural elements to grasses and sedges. And this is a, a really great photo that kind of helps you see how you can incorporate flowers or forbs into grasses and sedges. And by the way, this is uh, prairie drop seed. And I'll talk a little bit more about prairie drop seed later on. So for your tall grasses, I think for most people, the big thing in adding grass to the landscape is how tall and narrow 
and, and a vertical element that they can add to any planting. So when you're thinking about something that's tall and adding that vertical element, obviously you're thinking things like blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, because there are those really tall native options. I love Indian grass because of the feathery plume. That's the uh, grass you see on the left. And then on the right, you're looking at big blue stem. Nothing beats that light, airy look of those grasses, especially when they're in bloom. You got fluffy seed heads and slender and attractive stems that make those seed heads kind of dance in the wind. They add texture as well as a structural element to any landscaping bed. And of course, you just have to decide whether you want to go tall or short. So here's a little, or a big blue stem. And in the fall, big blue stem is a beautiful bronze as the photo displays. It can be a little bit aggressive though. So if you're thinking about using big blue stem, you really want to consider where you're using it and what the longevity of that bed is going to be and how much you want to maybe maintain that bed. Because one of the main things that everybody needs to know about the big prairie grasses is they can take over the world if you give them half a chance. And it might take them a few years, but they can and they will. They're nice and clumpy in grasses, but they do have a tendency to seed aggressively. While they may not run her out and take over you know, from the existing clump, they'll throw down a lot of seeds and the birds will help that happen. And so you're gonna end up with big blue stem everywhere. But it is a really pretty grass. And when you see it, when it's first growing, you know, like earlier in the season, you've got these beautiful greens and the blue tints and kind of purple. It's got a wonderful height. Sometimes it'll reach up to eight feet. And I have seen it go higher than eight. It's really attractive. And um, stems, not steams, sorry about that. <laughs> But a really great plant. Uh, big blue stem also was known as turkey foot by the early settlers because of the way the inflorescence. So this is switchgrass. And switchgrass, boy, talk about an aggressive grass. It has great golden fall color. It has structural interest in the winter. But it, it can be really aggressive if you have it in a small landscape. Even in a big landscape, I've watched it move through my prairie in the last 10 years and have been kind of surprised at how fast it moved through, even though there were a lot of other existing plants that could help keep it from moving. So beautiful plant, but just be warned. It's beautiful for a mass planting, as you see in this image. So you can do a solid border with it. It works well in a problem area where you might have some erosion. You can screen things with it. It just really can be a nice grass. I think sometimes it's a little overused. It has a nice fall color and the seed heads are interesting. And they're kind of airy looking. So it's, it is a pretty grass. But just be warned that whenever you put this in the landscape, there's gonna be a lot of it show up. Indian grass is a really, really a cool grass. I used to think that the reason it was called Indian grass was because the inflorescence was kind of feathery. But I found out since that it was reportedly associated with Native American camps, probably from disturbance of food cultivation and from the residents. So if you thought it was because of the feathery inflorescence, we were all wrong. But it's really a majestic plant. It can be a little bit aggressive in small landscape settings, but I think it's less aggressive than big blue stem and the uh, switchgrass. And the clumps are, I mean, they're just beautiful. When you see a clump of that in bloom, it's gorgeous. And you can have it as a standalone structural plant, or you can have that kind of mixed in with taller plants in the back of the border. It just really is a nice grass to have in and a lovely color. And here it is all along the edge of a moon lawn. And it, it's, it works, no matter where you put it, it works. So silver plume grass, this is one that is probably not real familiar to most people. Number one, because it's state listed in Ohio. Uh, Natives in Harmony only has the ability to grow this grass 
because we helped Shawnee State Forest out with growing some for them to move around the forest because that's the only place that we know of in Ohio where this grass occurs naturally. It's much more common in the southern states. And it can be absolutely gorgeous. So it's well worth having. It's just not one that you're going to find in just any landscape center. And it can be really pretty. For me, I think it's best as a screen or a border backdrop. When you use it as a specimen, it's not really, the clump isn't really all that thick. And I haven't thought it made that great of a specimen, although some people do use it as a specimen plant. I think it would be better in a grouping if you're gonna landscape with it. So Canada wild rye, there, <laughs> there is a lot of good things to say about this grass. Number one, it has beautiful seed heads, as you can see, nice color, fairly decent height that can go four to six feet. Usually you see it more along four or five out in, when you're out on the prairie. It's a short lived perennial though. So if you decide you wanna put in a bunch of Canada wild rye, don't expect it to last more than maybe four or five years. Cause that's about what I see it for tops as far as the clump goes. It's used a lot when people put in new prairie plantings because of being short lived and because it can get crowded out easily as other forbs, as forbs and other things take, take up space, then the wild rye kind of gets pushed to the side and it may show up where there's some disturbance, but it's really, I think, underused as far as a specimen plant, because I think it could make it really long. You can see the form is pretty, it's a clumping grass, so it's not, it's not gonna run around and take over the world. The seed heads are just gorgeous, no matter what time of year you're looking at them, whether they're completely mature or whether it's just bloomed. It's just a nice grass. And as I said, it's a short-lived perennial, so you can use it in a planting where you may want things to overtake it eventually. Now, we're gonna go into some medium height grasses. And of course you can see front and center in this photo, it's little blue stem. Little blue stem is used a lot in landscaping and there's a good reason for it. It's a gorgeous grass. There are a lot of naturally occurring variants in color. Most of the time though, the form is pretty consistent. It's gonna go usually about three to four feet, but sometimes it'll top out at two feet depending on what kind of weather you had that year. Blue stem's fall color is beautiful. It's, I think it's one of the best native plants for landscaping. It's got a compact growth habit. You can put that in there and the clump is just gonna get bigger and bigger. It's got this really cute kind of orangey pink fall color that will last a long time into the winter and so give you some inter winter interest. It's just a nice little grass and because it's a clumper, it's not gonna take over everything. It's one of those grasses that's pretty well behaved. And the seed heads are really pretty. When that thing starts to flower and then the seed heads get all fluffy, it's just beautiful. And it seems almost ethereal, almost like it's not really real when you see this thing going to seed. One thing I should mess is our wind made it. So while they may not really attract the pollinators to the flowers when they bloom, they still need to be pollinated by each other in order to create seeds. Now, prairie brome grass, this is another one of those grasses that you are not going to see very often. It's a really pretty kind of grayish blue foliage. This is one that's also state listed in Ohio. So there are several grasses I've already mentioned, the silver plume grass, this prairie brome is state listed. It was once found on the average prairie all over. Now it's really rare to find it. And it also is a short lived perennial. And it's kind of a short grass going only about to three feet, but the seed heads are really attractive and they're good food for birds. So if wanting to do a garden with bird food, really think about adding a lot of these grasses and sedges because they all provide food and cover. So here's your prairie brome. And as I said, you know, the seeds are really attractive when they're the blue gray, but then as they turn tan, they're still attractive. So it's still a pretty grass no matter what time of year you're looking at it. 
One of the things I think has the cutest flowers is side oats grama. And I couldn't resist this close up of oats grama flowers. You don't expect to have this bright orange flower on a grass and it's just adorable. You have to catch it when it's blooming to see those cute little orange flowers. And it's called side oats because the seeds and the flowers kind of hang on one side and it kind of makes it look a little bit like oats, which is how it got the name side oats. It's one of those grasses, as you can see here, that has a lot of your foliage is more at the base and then it'll shoot up a taller stem that will have the flower on it and then the seed on it. So you, you're not gonna have a whole lot of foliage going way up to three feet. You're just gonna have this lower short foliage and then you're gonna have this, the stems with the seeds. Sea oats is one that you either hate it or you love it. I personally love it. I think it's beautiful. Sea oats has a really pretty seed structure. I tried to show you all, all of the seed heads in all of these plants, just so you'd get an idea of you know, what they look like. Some of them you have to be really close, like the uh, side oats, but on sea oats, they're really big and dangly. So you can see those seed heads really well. And it's a broader leafed grass. So that in itself makes a statement. It really does well in the shade. And if you've got an area that you just want to put something in, it's gonna look good and cover the ground. Maybe it's a wet spot. This is a great plant for you. It'll self sow easily, so it'll complete, completely fill in and it sends out little runners, so that helps too. And if it goes somewhere where you don't want it, this grass is pretty easy to pull out by hand. And as the seeds are, when the seeds are young, they're still attractive. They're not nearly as big as what you saw in the previous picture. But I think it's a great plant. I think there's so much that you can do with this in the landscape. It always kind of hurts my feelings when people say they don't like it. Of course, I'm like that with all the native plants. So people just have to get used to that with me. I like them all. People ask what are my favorites and I can't hardly pick a favorite. They're all great. This plant, as I said, will go a little aggressive to some people's way of thinking. So you wanna make sure that where you put it in the landscape is someplace that can tolerate that. Now, bottle brush grass, this is one that you hardly ever see used in landscaping. I don't know why. I think it's one of the coolest grasses. Look at those seed heads. They kind of look like a bottle brush. So what's not to like about that? And it's a clumping grass. Now it has kind of a thinner look than some of the other medium to tall grasses. So it's not gonna be as robust or fill in like little blue stem does. But if you need a plant, a grass, that you don't want to take over the world, that you want to put in a shady area, bottle brush grass is a great one to put in there. You want something that's about medium height. And here's a picture of it. So you can get kind of that idea of how it looks in a bed. Now, Virginia wild rye, very similar to the nodding wild rye, but it doesn't nod. It, the seed heads aren't quite as long. It's a lot more upright plant. And this is another one that I think people don't know enough about, and so they're not using it. It's one that we grow that I just always wonder why nobody ever buys it. So, so maybe once you get a little more educated, you might think about buying this plant. It's a, a clumping plant. It's not huge, so it's nice in a it's nice in a shady garden. It's nice to just add where you want a little vertical structure, and of course, it's good for the birds. Virginia wild rye here is shown after Virginia wild rye is shown here with uh, seed heads turning brown. And it really is a nice grass. And I think a lot of people ought to consider using it instead of some of the alternative introduced grasses. Um, it, it's, it's been suggested that we might try using it for a mowed lawn. I've never tried this, so I don't know how that would work. So here we go, the one that everybody knows, and that's prairie drop seed. It's beautiful. There's nothing like that fountain-like foliage and it's just that arch, it's so pretty. 
And if you've ever smelled prairie drop seed in bloom, you have usually, you either think it smells like buttery popcorn or others, sometimes people think it smells like coriander. I'm more on the buttery popcorn side of things, but it's a beautiful grass. It's one that can be used in so many applications and lots of people are already using it. So it doesn't, doesn't really need more of a cheerleader per se, but it's a great grass. And it also is one of those native grasses that's state listed in Ohio. So it's threatened in the state of Ohio. And, you know, what can you say about the color except that it's gorgeous? You know, it's just beautiful. And you can, you can look at it by itself and go, wow, that's really pretty. It's got really fine leaves. So it's very fine texture, textured. And I always think those leaves kind of look like they go on forever until they just disappear. Low maintenance, it's really nice grass. So there's, it's no wonder that people really like this. And it's pretty massed. It's also pretty alone. So here's kind of a corner that's filled with the prairie drop seed. And it truly, truly is a spectacular grass. Now, there are short, a couple of shorter native grasses that I really want to bring up. Some really short ones like buffalo grass, not native in Ohio. So we don't grow it. And I really wouldn't know where to get it to find a, a local seed source for sure, since as far as I know, it's not native here. But there are a couple of really nice grasses that I think people should be aware of. And one of them is purple lovegrass. How can you not love a pasture or a field or a planting that looks like that? It's just gorgeous. So it's a short, clumping, warm season grass. And it's really pretty on a border. It kind of gives almost an ethereal look the seed heads are really airy. They don't appear till late August. So you've got this little short grass until the seed heads come. The one thing that some people don't like about it is the fact that when it matures, the flower stems will loosen. So the seed head will loosen and it'll detach and start blowing around in your yard like a tumble. I think that's cool. But it really does make a nice statement and it kind of fills in an area in a garden. So there's a lot of good things to consider as far as the purple love grass. And it's nice because it's just a short grass and sometimes you just want something short. So June grass, this is another one that I think more people need to be aware of. This is also another grass that is state listed as threatened in Ohio. And it's, it's a clumping grass, it's a cool season grass, it's got beautiful blue-green foliage. It likes a dry site. So if you've got an area that, boy, you can't hardly get anything else to grow, try some June grass in there because it can really take some tough sites. And it's beautiful. I love the seed heads on it. And it does not, as you can see, it's only two feet tall. That is not very tall. So it's a really nice diminutive grass and it stays in a clump. So if you want one that's gonna be pretty well behaved and stay where you put it, June grass is a good choice. And here are some examples of June grass. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that some people are now using it in uh, rooftop plantings for green roofs with sedum. I think that'd be kind of interesting. So we go on to sedges now. And sedges are one that I think really have not been noticed. Until this year, we've had all these great webinars this winter that talked a lot about grasses and sedges, and I can't believe how much more interest there is. So I'm really glad that people are starting to pay attention to the sedges. There are some really cool ones out there. The one that's in this picture is Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania sedge. They can be green and tufty and really versatile. They can take all kinds of different environments. Some are short, some are a little taller. Now you're not gonna find a six foot sedge, not in Ohio as far as I know, but you will find some sedges that may be reached up to close to four feet in a good area. And we'll take a look at some of those sedges now. So it's one of the largest genre of plants. It can be found just about any environment, whether you're in a woodland, or a swale, or a marsh, or a swamp, dry sand even, you can find sedges that like that kind of environment. 
And that's what makes it nice is there's a sedge for everything. The first sedge I want to talk about is Bicknell sedge. Um, also, many people know it as copper shouldered oval sedge. It's a beautiful sedge. It's also state listed. So here's another one of those plants that you could put in your landscape and help us to keep from losing these plants in Ohio. Now, the Bicknell sedge that Native and Harmony grows was found in Crawford County in the Sandusky Plains. It's one of the first sedges to set seed in the spring or in the early in the season. And so it's like usually, I think it's setting seed around June. So it's flowering in April and May, and then by June it's setting seed. And so the songbirds and the game birds like it. And it can do part shade, so that makes it nice too, because if you've got an area that maybe isn't full sun, this is another good set. And it's, it's an attractive set. It's got kind of thin, spiky stalks, and it's got a nice, clumping, very upright way of growing. So there's a lot you can do with it. Plains oval sedge. This is another one that it's pretty common. Where, where it's found, it's pretty common. Like it's not a rare sedge, but it's a very attractive sedge. And you can see from the seed heads, that has some interest. You're going to find it a lot of times in a dry, sandy prairie area or a meadow. Sometimes you'll find it in ditches. So do a little bit of moisture, but most of the time it's normal to dry. And then it's got a clumping habit too, where here you can see that it kind of fans outward from the base. And that's one of the things that I like about this uh, sedge is the way it grows. Now this is um, ivory sedge, and ivory sedge is really a teeny sedge. When we first got this sedge, we've got some, uh, ours came from South Bass Island, and, and it grows really, really nicely in rocky outcroppings and places where you wouldn't think there was enough soil to even support it, but it's a really nice short sedge, and it's kind of got that kind of lazy look to it where it's kind of laying down. And it can be used, it's a very delicate looking little sedge. So you can do a lot of things with it. You know, maybe do a whole planting where you want it to look more like a little yard and you've just got the whole thing, the whole area covered with this little ivory sedge. Yeah, I always laugh about this one. Uh, porcupine sedge, uh, hystericina. It makes me hysterically happy. It's so cute. It's a really nice sedge. It's got great seed heads. So half the fun of this sedge is just the seed heads. It's kind of low growing at three feet. It's a clumper, so that makes it nice too. And sometimes those seed heads will blow around a little bit in the wind. This is also a really great food source for birds. And of course, some of the butterflies, moths, and skippers use it as host plants. Nice clumping habit. You can see that it doesn't really go upright a lot. It goes upright a little in the center, but everybody else kind of lays down, which gives it that rounded look to it. Common hop sedge. This is another one that I think is, it's a pretty nice sedge. A uh, little bigger seed head than you're going to find on the porcupine sedge, a little more spiky looking. But it's a really nice sedge for wetlands. If you've got a wet area, it's used a lot in uh, prairie restoration. Again, about three foot tall. And it can take some partial shade. So this is a good one if you've got a wet spot in that backyard near a tree. Here we go. And th this one you can see is not as thick at the base. And this one has more of an upright habit. So you get more of that. Um, vertical look to it than you would with the horizontal spread spread or the mounding. Just there are so many sedges, so many sedges. And I was worried that I would make this presentation too long. So I didn't put half the sedges I wanted to in here. But we can talk about them later. Pennsylvania sedge. I think this is probably one of the most commonly used sedges in landscaping. It performs really well. 
in a sunny kind of normal to dry area. And it can take shade too. So that's really nice. It's only six inches to a foot tall, which makes a lot of people happy because they want something that's gonna look more like a lawn. It has really fine textured leaves and has that kind of creeping habit. It also is one of the early sedges to set seed. And so it makes a good food source for songbirds. And some people are using it a lot like you see here where you've got it just kind of using it as the entire focus of an area and just fill in that area in with that Pennsylvania sedge. Now rose sedge, this is a new one that the nursery just got last year. Uh, well, actually we just started selling it last year. I have a wonderful young man. I, I don't know if Alex is in on this presentation, but Alex Patton, who just started another na a native plant nursery in the Pascal area, by the way, he, he went, was on a sedge kick for several years and he brought me sedge seeds all the time, which I just absolutely loved because I'm so busy with the nursery. I don't have time to get out and look for new things. And Alex brought me this rose sedge. It's adorable. It's really tiny, you know, like a foot tall is pushing it for this sedge. And it's a clumper and it's got a really round growth habit. It's just the cutest thing ever. And it, it's a great seed producer. So I imagine it would be a good one to fill in with. And we're excited to be able to start offering this sedge this year. And you can see the seed heads up in the uh, upper left-hand corner there. And then there's another photo of how kind of rounded it looks. And this is a fall pictures so you can see how it looks as it gets later in the season. Fox sedge. Now, I didn't even know anything about fox sedge until I put my rain garden in and this sedge showed up in the rain garden. And I was kind of looking at it thinking, well, I don't even know what this is and had to have good old Alex ID it for me because I couldn't figure out what it was. But it turned out to be care Carrots vulpinoidea, brown fox sedge. And this is an awesome sedge. It's good for a rain garden because it can take that alternating level of moisture, but it also can take a really dry area. I've had it move out into the mound in the center of our driveway, which is about as high and dry as you can get. And the fox sedge looks just as great out there as it does in the rain garden. And it's generally two to two and a half feet here, although it can go a little taller. And it looks a lot like prairie drop seed because of that kind of rounded shape and because the leaves are pretty fine. So if you've got an area that maybe you wanna add something to the prairie drop seed that looks similar, but not quite the same, or maybe you've just got really bad soil and you don't wanna put prairie drop seed in, this is a good choice. So, wow, I really sped through that. So th this is just a reminder. I want you to remember that our gardens play a critical ecological role in the landscape. We need to, we need to have those natives in the landscape. We need to encourage healthy populations of pollinators, birds, and other wildlife. And we can do that by every one of us putting something native in our landscape. I'm not a proponent for getting rid of everything. If you have something you like that's cultivated, by all means, keep it. Just try to get some of those natives in the yard in your landscape as well. And this is a, this is a picture I had to include it. Uh, this is uh, when I first started the prairie here at Natives in Harmony. This is what it looked like early on. And you can see that big clump of big blue stem kind of rising up out of the center of everything. But it kind of shows you how nicely put together a little prairie patch can be because you've got all these plants that are different heights and they all have their own purpose. They all serve their own purpose. And they're pretty. <laughs> you can't take away from the beauty of it all. Now, I wanted to mention some other sedges that I didn't put in the slideshow because I was afraid I would go too long. So we've got Terry sedge, which is a pretty short sedge and it, it does woodland pretty well. There's bristly sedge, which is another kind of those medium sized sedge. 
fringe sedge, oh my goodness, it has a really long seed head that dangles and it likes a wet area, but it can take medium soil. Then there's meadow sedge, also another really good choice for an open sunny area and can handle those wet spots. Gray sedge, another one of those little short sedges. Hop, false hop sedge is a lot like hop sedge. Then there's sallow sedge, which is kind of a pale yellowish color much of the time and hence the name, but it's a runner sedge. So if you've got an area that you really want to fill out, sallow sedge is a good choice for that. And then one that we found here, uh, Carex palita broadleaf woolly sedge. And this is one of those kind of wet meadow or damp medium moisture meadows that it will just, when it goes in, it runners all over and it just fills it in. So you can have all these beautiful forbs and then you have this really nice thin leaf, even though the name says broad leaf, it's still a very thin leaf sedge and it just looks beautiful in between all the flowering plants. Then Sartwell sedge, if you have an area that you really need to hold the soil, Sartwell sedge is a good one for you. It will runner throughout your wet area and it will lock in that soil. And so you won't have a lot of soil loss from there. And the plastic sedge also likes a wet place, but it will form a tussock. So it'll form kind of a lump there. It's not gonna runner all over, Tussock sedge is a lot of times the, that mound that you bounce on from one little mound to the other in a wet area. And in many cases, it'll be that tussock sedge. I threw some ideas for places where you could look for, um, for different information on landscaping and sedges. The one that I found that I really liked is the vers versatile sedges for lawn and garden. And that was, that's in the newsletter called the Native Plant Herald done by the Prairie Nursery. And that little article is really good. I really highly recommend that. All right, you ready? Okay, so our first question, um, and you mentioned some of this, but in general, will sedges spread into surrounding lawn or is it necessary to build into your planting design a border or path between sedge area and lawn? I think it depends on the sedge whichever sedge you're using. It doesn't matter what plant you have. If you've got one that tends to run or out, that's gonna be the one that's gonna encroach into the lawn faster than one that is a clumping. So if you've got sedges that are clumpers, you don't have to worry so much about that from them running out from the clump, although they will throw some seed around and that seed can go just about anywhere. But even with a path or something, the seed can still spread across the path or across your little mulched area. Okay, thank you. Next question, mm -hmm. is sweetgrass one that will be able to be used without being invasive? No. <laughs> if you've got a spot where sweetgrass is happy, sweetgrass doesn't stay put. It's one of those runnery things that, um, oh, sweetgrass is beautiful, I love sweetgrass, but it's not one that you can put in the landscape and expect it to stay where you put it. It's gonna move all around. It does like a wetter area. So if you try to put it in too dry of a spot, it's not gonna survive anyway. Okay. And you mentioned a little bit of this, but how do you control an aggressive grass or sedge in general? Depending, depending on the grass. So in the case of um, sea oats, you can pull them up pretty easily. They're, they're not as deep rooted as they might be and they're pretty easy to just jerk up out of the ground. Um, sometimes you'll have to dig or put a little, you know, kind of a barrier in there. Um, it, it can be hard on some of them and big blue stem, you know, the taller prairie grasses, they really shoot some deep roots. And so when they get a foothold in a bed where you don't want them, you're gonna do some digging. Okay. So you mentioned I think a lot of times people can oh, go ahead. No, it's okay. Continue. Oh, well, I think a lot of times uh, folks will try to kill off areas where it's going where it shouldn't be by maybe putting cardboard down and, you know, putting some kind of a barrier up, but still maybe you want to plant something else there. And so doing something like that isn't beneficial either. 
it just depends. I think you're better off if you're going to go with the grass that you want in a certain spot and you don't really want it moving around. I think you're better off sticking with grasses that clump because they're less likely to take over. Good tip. All right. And this one is from me mainly because I was curious. So the ones that you mentioned that are rye, can you eat that or is it just ornamental? Um, I think the native peoples used it as an emergency food. It really doesn't have a very large seed inside. So they're in that family, but that doesn't mean that they're, you know, something that you can just go grind up. Native Americans did use them, but they were an emergency. Like it would took too much work. They didn't just eat them because they were available. They ate them because they were always available. And a lot of times, with that, Native Americans also, uh, because of the barbs on the Canada wild rye, they would not haul game. If they had shot meat and had, to, they would skirt around the areas that had the Canada wild rye because the barbs on the seeds would stick in deep and then they had to really work to try to get those back out. They would avoid those areas when they were carrying fresh, freshly butchered meat back to the camp. That is neat. All right, next question. What grasses are good to use as specimen grasses? And also what, in, in my case, what's a specimen grass? So a specimen grass is one that you've got sitting out there all by itself. So you, you know, like maybe you big blue stem, want that to be the focal part of a bed, the focal point. So that would be more of a specimen grass, you know, to me. Now, I, I do have to say, I am really not a landscaper. I grow these plants to sell them, but I, I've never had any formal training as a, as a landscaper. So I just have to throw that out there. <laughs> but to me, a specimen grass is one that you put out there that's kind of by itself. Maybe you put a clump of three of them as a focal point, but you're not filling in an area with them. And the specimen grasses are usually the, the ones that are clumpers. So the ones like big blue stem, Indian grass, little blue stem that stay put more or less and stay in a clump and don't run her out and then just take over six feet in one year. All right, thank you. Next one, which of the grasses can withstand deer or rabbit foraging? Well, for one thing, deer aren't really grass grazers. So most of the grasses, they're not gonna mess with very much. Um, they do forage on some once in a while. I mean, we, we have them here at the nursery all the time, and I never have trouble with them in the grasses or the sedges. They're always eating the flowering plants. So yeah. I, I don't, I guess it depends on the area and how much forage the deer have. But as far as we've seen here, I don't see a lot of trouble with deer foraging on grasses or sedges. What about rabbits? Well, rabbits will nibble on the grasses, um, but also there again, I have more trouble with them on my forbs, nipping off things like milkweeds than I do on the grasses. They'll sharpen their teeth on a tree and cut off a little sapling, but they don't seem to bother the grasses that we have out here that much. So I, I really don't think I've got the experience to be able to really say this one versus that one, because I don't see it here. That is fair. So somebody else asked, does anything grow in full shade? Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, you can do you can do the um, little rose sedge. It can handle the full shade and the Pennsylvania sedge can handle it. And also I'm told the uh, uh, hairy sedge, which I don't think I talked about, but I know I've heard that it can handle full shade. We're working, you know, Natives in Harmony didn't really focus on sedges until Alex started bringing us lots of sedge seed. So we're learning about sedges as we go. Could you explain what to do um, for winter? So sometimes I'll see, I'll see a group of grasses that's been cut and others people leave up all winter. So is there a general rule of thumb? For us, it's leave them up all winter. Uh, most plants do better with their full, all the old growth on them over the winter. They survive the winter better. So for no, no other reason than that, I think that's a good reason to do it. 
but also if you've got grass and have hollow stems. And a lot of our native bees winter over in hollow stems. So if you cut all the dead things down at the end of the season you, and take them off site, you're effectively also removing all your native bees. Wow, I had no idea. All right. And so I think it's better to just leave it on and it feeds the birds as well if you've got a grass that produces seed. Okay, thank you. So somebody asked, do you have a species list that we can access? But I believe one of your last slides was a list of those resources. And what all, what all- It was a list of some of the sedges. Okay. <laughs> it was a list of the sedges. Um, people can email me and that the email is gle, G -L -E, at nativesinharmony.com. They can find the, the uh, email on my website too. But you can email me and ask me for an availability list. It changes all the time as people are ordering sedges and things, and as we get things potted up. Okay, I also put it at the bottom of the chat. So great. Get back to my list. Um, it says, can you comment about using native grasses and sedges for those wet spots in our yard? and using for absorbing rainwater, you know, the ones with deep roots. Oh, yes, there are a lot that you can use in a rain garden situation or in a wet spot. Many of those sedges can really take being in a really seriously wet spot. Uh, the sallow sedge, the fringe sedge, and it depends on what you want out of that, out of that plant. So there are grasses like switchgrass that can handle some of that. And I've seen big blue stem used in rain gardens. I've seen little blue stem used in rain gardens. And as far as the grasses go, sea oats. Sea oats is another one that you could really use very effectively in a wet spot. And it would love it there. But a lot of the sedges take wet areas quite well. And so there's a lot of sedges out there that you can use. Fox sedge is one that's variable. So if you've got a rain garden, the fox sedge is a really great one to use because fox sedge can take being completely inundated and then go to being completely dry. Thank you. Next question, can you, can you plant native perennial flowers in amongst sedges or will the sedges crowd them out as they spread? I have to stop and think about that. Okay, so if you're going with something that is in a clump, you're much better off as far as putting forbs in between it, your flowering plants, your perennials, because you've got this sedge or this grass that has by its nature, the desire to stay together, stay in a clump. If you put in a sedge that's a runner sedge or a grass that tends to run her out more, then yes, um, you know, you may find that you don't like the way that sedge or grass is taken over where your flowers are. You want them all to stay separated. Use a grass or sedge that stays in a clump. Easy enough. All right, and this question is actually probably more for me. Can we get a clickable link for the recommended Prairie website? Um, and all the, so anything where you listed a link, when I send out the survey, the video link, I will also put all of the websites that you mentioned in as a clickable oh, link for everybody. Good. Okay. I have a whole bunch of thanks you. Thank yous for somebody. And sorry, I'm getting a bunch of things that people can't hear my questions. My apologies. <laughs> um, here we go. Do sedges tend to establish quickly from seed? So would somebody need to start from plants or would they start from seeds? I think he, I think you're as well off going with seed if you can get the seed. From my experience, most of the sedges grow pretty quickly from seed. And I think there again, it depends. There are some of the sedges that have to go through a cold moist stratification process. And so, you know, you want to make sure you know what it takes to get that seed to germinate. 
but absolutely there's no reason why you can't grow most of these from seed even the grasses they're not all that hard some of the grasses don't have to go through cold moist stratification some of them like prairie drop seed need to okay and for anybody, if you check on the library website, we actually have um, growing seeds in a milk jug. And that entire video program is about how to how to basically grow through stratification <laughs> using a milk jug. So check out the library YouTube webpage for that one. Uh, the next question, are there any grasses or sedges that do well as container plants? Lots of them. <laughs> there are a lot of them. I, as a matter of fact, I have a... I have a planter that has had June grass in it for five or six years, and I have never put it away. It stayed outside all winter long in that same planter year after year after year. And the June grass is doing wonderfully. And all I have to do is add a little soil to it every year for the soil that got washed out over the winter. So that, that's an example of one. I have a prairie drop seed in a big tree pot that's been in that tree pot for probably four or five years. There are a lot of them that will do really well. You just have to make sure you have a big enough pot to accommodate the roots. Okay, thank you. Somebody asks, where is your nursery and when do you open for the season? Wow. We're, the nursery is in Morrow County. We're about halfway between Mansfield and Columbus, out, out on a dirt road. So you, <laughs> it might show up on your maps or on your map quest or, or um, program as Penland Pike, P-E-N-L-A-N. But um, Natives in Harmony opens Easter Sunday, actually. Our That'll be our first day, which is a Sunday, of course. It's uh, April 17th. And then from then on, we're open Saturday, Sunday, and Monday through October. And we'll open with spring ephemerals. So we'll have some of the grasses and sedges ready to go too, but we'll have a lot of things like bluebells and Dutchman's britches and squirrel corn and all those things. All right, and I actually have a specific one. Can sweet grass be contained in a pot without taking over? Yes, fully. I did an experience, or experience, an experiment once. Uh, when I was running the prairie at Ohio State in Marion, I wanted to put switch or um, sweet grass in a bed, but I didn't want it to move outside of its space. So I got a big tree pot cut the bottom out of it, filled it with soil that was a good moisture retaining mix and put the sweet grass in it and it did just fine. And it never moved outside of that pot. But it takes a little work to bury the pot so that the grass can't go underneath of it. But you can cut the bottom of the pot out. You just need to have the sides there to keep that grass from running out to the side. Also, Gail did a program for us last year on spring ephemerals. So again, check out the library YouTube webpage and type in Gail and spring ephemerals and she will pop right up. Oh, yeah, that was a fun one too. That was a fun one. I did plant some. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much for